we create an enemy because it looks better the politicians could go grandstand they don't actually you know, as, an, as a former asset I can assure you they don't actually do anything on terrorism they give speeches they go, they go wave their hands in the parades but they don't do anything to contribute to anti-terrorism efforts they, and, but, but the people have been fooled by their, by their showmanship and their grandstanding and the spectacle and it's like a circus performance now in fact before 9-11 there were 200 to 300 terrorists in the world who wanted to attack America now, now after 9-11 and after the war in Iraq and after Afghanistan there's only about 2,000 to 3,000 individuals whose entire focus of life is revenge and coming into the United States and attacking us. That's only 3,000 people. The way I look at it, this is like a high school auditorium that you could fill with potential terrorists. That's right. it. This is right. an invention. We've made this up. Right. Very, very well put. You know, I've often explained to people that there was no real terrorist threat pre-9-11 uh, and that for, you know, for every one person pre-9-11 who was bent on doing harm to the U.S., uh, there must be a great many today because of all the terrible things that have gone on since 9-11. Uh, but yes. this, this, so the question then is, is it just sheer total incompetence and stupidity and grandstanding and egotism? I'm sure all of that contributes to it, but... Uh, well, frankly, Susan, my take on all of this is that 9/11 was a Mossad operation. That the uh, there was a it was of course done through Cheney's office. It was not there were no hijackings. The guys that they blamed for it were not terrorists at all. They weren't even on the planes. There would there's not a shred of evidence that any of these guys were on these planes. Nor is there a shred of actual evidence that there were any hijackings. Instead, we had a military operation that was essentially a Zionist coup d'état by the Likud faction that wanted to destroy Iraq so it would never be a threat to Israel. And that's why uh, a prosperous Iraq ally to the U.S. would actually be terrible for Israel, and that's why they wouldn't take the deals that you were brokering. Do you care to comment? I, I think that you are I, – I do believe in the hijackings, but I believe in everything else that you have just said. Um, one of the things that came out right after 9-11, I had a uh, – I've often been asked by people what, the, what Richard Fuse is, my CIA Richard Fuse, what his source was uh, for, for, for the 9-11 attack. And he told me briefly, he let it slip. Immediately after the attack, when we were all in a state of shock, he says to me uh, that, that it was bef the first building had collapsed, but it was before the second building collapsed. This is a very important time frame. And he made reference to a videotape, which, by the way, was not released until the next day to the public. But right after 9-11, Richard Fuse already knows about this videotape. Right after the attack, he ought to, he ought, you know, the first building has collapsed, the second one is still standing. And we're shouting, we're both talking in the living room, shouting, I'm, I'm in my living room, he's in his living room, we're shouting at the televisions, and he blurts out to me, Susan, how many times do you think a camera is queued up waiting for a car accident to occur? He said, what do you think are the odds that those two people were just standing on the sidewalk with a video camera queued up to the World Trade Center, that their hands are steady and focused, they're not whipping the camera around, there's no hysteria, they're waiting patiently for the plane to hit the building. And he said, those are Mossad agents. They knew, it, they knew that, that the World Trade Center was about to get hit, and they were waiting there for it to happen so that they could record it and put it out on the media. Now, this is before it's even come out on the media, but he identifies them as Mossad agents, and I believe, I'm convinced, that that was the source of our knowledge of Al-Qaeda. But what you guys don't know, which I will throw out to you, which it comes out in my book, is that from April and May of 2001 onwards, Richard Fuse instructed me to threaten the Iraqis with war. Now, everybody presumes that the war stuff came after 9-11, but it didn't. 
they had decided months before 9-11 ever happened that as soon as this attack occurred, this would be the, mo the, 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 the motivation for the war. So they absolutely knew that this attack would, they knew that it was going to be in late August or September, and that opens up a whole new dynamic, proving what you have just said, that it was a Mossad conspiracy, uh, that there were complicity. Maybe that's a better word. Compl I, 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 I'm, I'm going to go a little softer on, on the language than you. Okay, well, yeah, well, Mossad we'll complicity. Okay. Sorry. Well, I, yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that it's a little more than complicity, uh, that the uh, demolition of the three tallest buildings ever to be taken down and controlled demolitions required immense uh, uh, skill and uh, military specialization and so on, and that all came out of... Uh, oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. When I, when I say complicity, I, 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 I include that in that. Yes, yes. I believe in the detonations. In fact... Are, are we? Do, do I have to time to tell you one story before break? Okay, uh, tell it. Go for it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, while I was writing my book, I met a high-ranking State Department official who has a, a very, very, very high top, top, top security classification, and I cannot name him for you because I don't want to hurt his rep. I don't want to hurt his his. He's, he's close to retirement. He's going to have a pension. He's going to, you know, they, they would crush him if he was ever exposed. I suspect. He thinks it, too. Um, but he says that a couple of weeks before 9-11, at, at the end of August, for about two weeks, two weeks, strange vans were arriving at the World Trade Center at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they were staying, they was, he, he swore to me, they were staying from 3 to about 5 o'clock, 4.35. They were coming in for a brief period, and he swore to me that he personally had investigated, he personally had investigated the janitorial services, and, the, and how, he said, I know firsthand how many uh, janitorial, how many employees the janitorial service had, what their trucks look like, what their revenues are like, where they live. He said, I could tell you, I, we, we, we know the addresses. We are confident that none of these people in the janitorial services were tied to these trucks. And he said that they, they were arrived for about, it, it had never happened before. It was a unique thing. This was not a constant thing that over a year, over like a previous six-month period. This was a strange anomaly right before the World Trade Center. And he was convinced that this was government-level thermite, this was government-level weapons that had been put into the, either, either the, the, the stairwells or the elevator shafts. And he was convinced that this is how, this is when it happened. Well, and well, um, he other, retires, other people who are, pension. sorry. Hope he, hope he comes out uh, after he retires and uh, gets that pension and speaks out. <laughs> uh, well, I, I tell you, I've got, uh, sorry, go on. Uh, okay, well, you know, we, we are pretty much at the break point, so let's go ahead and take our five-minute mid-show break.